Thank you, Miss Stacy and Dad and Roger Dale. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse number 11. Last week, I did what was basically an introductory sermon to this whole text in verses 11 through 22. So we're really trying to look at this whole section, 11 to 22, together. And I laid a foundation by giving you some background to the issue that Paul is addressing in this text, and that is the division in the early church between Jew and Gentile. Now, if you didn't catch that uh, sermon, go back online and you can either listen to it or watch it, and it'll help you uh, as we continue to go through these verses. And of course, we have divisions today in the professing church of Jesus Christ. We have all these denominations and we have lots of doctrinal differences which are important. Doctrine does divide and that's necessary in a lot of areas because there's a lot of false doctrine that is entrenched in professing churches. We have different cultures and opinions and traditions and preferences. And as I said last time, we're all sinners saved by grace, but sinners still. And, and, and all of that creates disunity in the professing church of Jesus Christ or what some would call uh, the theologians would call the church visible, the, the outwardly professing church of Jesus Christ, and that covers a vast array of beliefs and understanding. And yet isn't it interesting that when Jesus prayed that very intimate prayer to the Father in John chapter 17, He prayed this in verse 21 of John 17. That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, and that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, Do you believe that any of Jesus' prayers go unanswered? I don't. Did he not always perfectly pray according to the will of the Father? So how do we square that with all the disunity and division that exists within the professing church. Well, John MacArthur gives us a very helpful distinction about this issue. He says, that prayer was answered positionally. That was Jesus expressing a prayer for the unity of the church, which in position does actually exist. All truly regenerate believers are one in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is One spirit with him. That's every truly regenerate believer alive now or that has ever or will ever live. And so 
while that is indeed true, positionally, practically, in real time, down here in responsibility land where we live, it doesn't really work out that way too well now, does it? As Shakespeare once said, ah, there's the rub. That's the problem. Now, we read last time, and we will again, a great statement on the positional unity of the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 13. Listen to what Paul says. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, it's talking about our body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, remember that's Gentiles, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So remember, he's saying, like a human body is one body, so the true church is one body, unquestionably. The Holy Spirit indwells all truly regenerate, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, believers, no matter what church they attend. Now, that statement takes a lot of nuance to unpack, which I won't do right now. But nonetheless, that is not a debatable statement. If a person's saving faith is indeed genuine, that statement is a fact. And when the Spirit of God puts the true life of God in the soul of a man and thereby unites him with every other person in whom that same eternal life exists and draws us together in union with Christ, we actually do become one body positionally with Christ as the head, with Christ as the chief shepherd. Now, for example, when we had our men's night mashup right here in this room, every man in this room was made up of three different local churches. And every man in the room who possesses true, genuine, saving faith is united positionally together into one body of Christ, the, the true church of Jesus Christ. But however, if I came in here today and I said to you, church, after the meeting, all of us men got together and we had a vote and we decided that we're going to merge all three churches together into one great Reformed Baptist church. Whoa, Nelly! Oh, hello, Houston! Pastor, you got some splitting to do, would be your reaction. Okay? Why? Because, practically speaking, we would have issues, would we not? We've even seen this. Each church has its own way of doing things. Each church likes its way of doing things. Then there are second and third level doctrinal issues. There are certain opinions and traditions and all manner of little pigeonholes that we set ourselves down into. Now, especially in this current day and age, it would be 
a, a good idea for all eight of the Here We Stand churches to come together for many reasons. And positionally speaking, every truly saved one of us are actually in the same body of Christ. But practically speaking, mainly because we're sinners, this would be a bridge just a little too far to cross. So, to try and help in this area, to get somewhat closer to what Jesus prayed in his prayer there in John 17 that I quoted, that's part of the reason why we started the Here We Stand conference. And here recently, the men's night mashup. So that we can at least have some opportunity to come together both practically and positionally a few times a year and participate with other members of the same body of Christ who are a part of other local churches. Now, remember from last time, we come to verse 11 here in Ephesians 2. Paul is dealing with this same issue of disunity in the church, but at a much more intense level than we will ever come anywhere close to. The division in the early church between the Jews and the Gentiles. Again, we laid the groundwork for that intensity in the message last time, so I won't go over that ground again. Paul's tremendous message here in the text and in other parts of the New Testament is that all of us, again, true believers are one in Christ. Look at Galatians 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All. Now, you might not like that in the case of everybody represented in the all in this verse. You may not want to be associated with everybody represented in the all in this verse. But if you are truly a Christian, again, you are, positionally speaking, one with them more than just associated with them. You are family members with them in position. And God loves all His family members equally. No family member has preferential love over another family member. So as one very godly deacon used to tell us at the Foster Road Baptist Church, we better get to figuring out how to get along with one another down here because we're going to be together forever up there. Now, Paul goes on to say in Galatians 3, verses 27 to 28, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, again, Gentile. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I don't know how he could possibly be any clearer. In other words, all distinctions are gone in the spiritual area. Positionally speaking, there is absolute equality in Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he sees us all as one. There's no class system in the church. Romans 10, verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, Jewish mission work is great. And as I've said many times, it's desperately needed, especially in Israel, where the majority of the country is atheistic 
and either subscribes to modern day Judaism, which is false religion. But what we don't need is this sort of messianic Jew movement that believes in Jesus, but they still want to hold on to all the old Jewish customs. Oh, let's have a Christian bar mitzvah and have a, let's have some Christian rabbis and this separate class of Christians for ethnic Jews. No, Jewish people ethnically, they need to be integrated into the church. That type of, of messianic Jew movement goes directly against the grain of what Paul is teaching us here in Ephesians chapter 2. I made reference last time to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, and I won't take the time to get into it. You can go back and read all about it. They dealt with this Jew-Gentile issue, and guess what? They came up with the right conclusion. Their conclusion was Jews and Gentiles should be one in Jesus Christ and they should be one in the church. No distinctions. The discord and disunity between in the church between Jews and Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in the early church again was at an intensity level that is very hard for us as 21st century people to grasp. If you look down at verse 14, here in 2, it says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. There was a serious, thick, dividing wall between these two groups. And we're going to get to a little bit more of that in just a minute. But I want to remind you, again, of the complexity involved here for just a minute. Remember I told you that in Old Testament times, God purposely made the Jews distinct in many ways from all the other people groups around them. They had so many strict laws about diet and clothing and marriage and worship and festivals and all these different laws and distinctions that there was just no way that those people could fit into any other kind of society. But that was partially intended, remember, to make them a witness nation to all the other nations around them. In general, God gave them all these differences for two general reasons. One, to call the attention of the world to them as a witness, but also at the same time to keep them separated. But instead of being used as a tool and being a witness to the one true God, well, we can open our Old Testament and read all about what actually happened. Instead of, of, of being a tool, they either, they either joined in with the idolatry of the other nations, or on the other hand, they became carnal and prideful and selfish about their position as children of Abraham and they look down their noses at everybody else. But before you get too hard on them, do you know another group that acts like this? Hmm? The church. Aren't we supposed to be different from the world? Hmm? Doesn't the Bible call us to that? Aren't we supposed to talk different? Walk different? Think differently? Aren't we supposed to be a witness to our king in the way in which we live, which is to not be like the world? Aren't we supposed to walk in love and light and wisdom and power of the Spirit? And doesn't God want us that way? To be different from the world so that the world will take note of us and want to know, what is it that that they have in their life that we don't have. And while being a witness in the world, doesn't God also want us to be separated from the world in such a way that we don't get tangled up in their ways? It's the same two things all over again, isn't it? And yet, how often do we fail just like the Jews did in Old Testament times. What we see happen so often in the broadly used term of evangelicalism is instead of our being a channel to reach the world, 
We become our own little isolated group with our own little lingo and our own little code and our own bumper stickers and our own radio stations and it's us for no more shut the door. And that has happened. And just like with these Jews, that is not how God wants us to be. Now that could be a sermon in itself, but we're going to move on in the text. Look at verse 11. And our first point will be the social element of alienation. Look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you the Gentiles, so that's who he's addressing, in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So Paul starts by describing not the past state of sin of the Gentiles. Remember, he did that earlier in chapter 2 where he said, you are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. And we went through all of that. Now he's going to start talking about their state of alienation. And he's telling them here that you Gentiles in the church, you used to be alienated socially. And coming up next in verse 12, he's going to tell them you also be used to be alienated spiritually. And he's telling them, I want you to remember that alienation. That's what he's saying to them. And so why does he want them to remember these things? Well, just like with us today. It's good for you to remember where you were and what you were before you came to Christ because it makes you a lot more thankful for where you are, right? I mean, it's real easy for me to remind myself every day because of the very stark contrast of my existence B.C. and after Christ saved me. And you should do that too. Remember what you used to be. Just like he's telling these Gentiles. Remember, you used to be alienated. You used to be the one really alienated from God and from God's people, as I'm fixing to show you. Remember. Now, don't be obsessed with, but remember your unregenerate days. F.F. Bruce says this, nothing is so apt to promote gratitude as a retrospective glance fixed on the whole of the pit from whence we have been dug, end quote. So Paul says here in verse 11, formerly you were Gentiles physically, you were uncircumcised, but you used to be Gentiles. Formerly. The big point is, There are Jews and there are Gentiles, yeah, until you get to the church. And then they're neither. So you used to be Gentiles. You used to be a Jew. Now you're in Christ, period, paragraph, end of distinction. Of course, you can still be a Jew ethnically and all other Gentiles can be all ethnicities, but that's not the angle here. Now, still in verse 11, remember that You, formerly you Gentiles who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. In other words, as far as the Jews were concerned, prior to the church here, you Gentiles were all outcasts. And they called them the uncircumcision. And for the Jews, that was a term of mockery. It was a term of derision. It was a a term of defamation from the Jewish perspective. The, The Gentiles didn't have the surgical sign of Genesis 17 to mark them out as the people of God. So they so they called them the uncircumcision. Remember what David said? And Goliath came out. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? You see how he used that word. And like I said last time, the Jews were very proud to be called the circumcision. They would like to be called that. In fact, most of them were far more proud of the external operation 
than anything that was happening on the inside of them. And that was the big problem with the most of them. They had perverted the whole thing. Well, watch this. Paul levels a shot at them here in verse 11 because of that. Look what he says. By the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. That means strictly physical here. Meaning those who are physically circumcised, but they're not spiritually circumcised. And he gets right at this, if you want to really understand what he's talking about here, in Romans 3, verses 28 to 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So that ought to help you Paul's, understand Paul's shot there in verse 11 a little better. Paul is saying, yeah, they, 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 they're the circumcision, all right. So-called in the flesh is what they are. They think they're the true people of God just because of that, but it's only external. And so it was the people with the outward sign with no inward reality who would mock the Gentiles. And the bigger point here is he makes the emphasis to demonstrate the social alienation. There was just no way that they could enter into a relationship. And from the human perspective, it certainly looked like this was going to be an insurmountable problem in the early church. And then Paul goes on next in verse 12 to demonstrate spiritual alienation. Look at verse 12. Remember that you were at that time, that's the Gentiles, prior to salvation, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Wow. That's some serious alienation, is it not? That's not social. That's spiritual. Understand, the Gentiles, before Jesus came, before the gospel came, were literally cut off from God in every way. And I'm going to show you five ways right here. First of all, they were Christless. Look again at verse 12. Separate from Christ, meaning they were separated from the Messiah, meaning they had no messianic hope before Christ. The Jews had messianic hope, right? They just killed him when he came. The Gentiles had no hope of a savior prior to Christ, no anticipation of a deliverer. There was nothing like that on their radar at all. History was going absolutely nowhere for them. They had no anticipation of an ultimate judge who would make wrong right. There would be no day of vengeance and true justice. There would be no balancing of the scales. They had a hopeless view of history because it was one with no Christ, no Messiah to come. These, this group worshiped Diana of the Ephesians, also known as Artemis. Now, when I say that, Diana, you might picture in your mind this large statue in Ephesus of a very beautiful woman, but you would be very wrong about that statue. The statue of Diana in Ephesus was a huge, big, black, ugly beast with nipples hanging out of its stomach. And for some kind of horrific reason, I'm sure, and I didn't even look into why because I don't want to know why the statue had that happening. That's all they had to worship. History was going nowhere for them. Life was just a meaningless treadmill for them. They had no Christ, no hope, no anointed king and savior to make all things right. They were Christ-less. To be Christ-less 
is to be God-less in this verse, and it's also to be hope-less, as we're fixing to see. That's a warning for all the smart folks out there who say it doesn't really matter what religion you believe as long as you believe and you're sincere. God accepts all the religions. Not according to that verse. This verse says, if you are Christless, you are hopeless, and you are godless. Acts 4.12 makes it real clear. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, which means every other religion in the world is false. Period. Now, secondly, the Gentiles were stateless. Why do you use that word? We'll look next in verse 12. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise. They were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. What does that mean? Well, remember, God had built a nation. God had built a theocracy. And that nation, though they had all kind of issues that you can read about in the Old Testament, was the recipient of his blessing. That nation was the target of his special love. How many times in the Old Testament did they disobey God, nationally speaking, and he still came back to them and he gave them grace over and over and over again? Sound familiar? It ought to sound familiar to you. That nation had a special arrangement with God that no other nation had. And the Gentiles were excluded from that commonwealth is what Paul is saying. That's why I say they were stateless in the most meaningful kind of way. They had no community that was under the leadership of the one true God, again, in spite of their repeated disobedience, God gave them, the Jews, a theocracy. He ruled over them. He gave them a priesthood. He gave them laws. He gave them His blessing. But the Gentiles, by and large, they didn't know that. They didn't even understand any of that. They lived without God's rule. They lived outside of God's kingdom in the spiritual sense. And then thirdly, connected to that, Paul says they were covenantless. Look in, next in verse 12. Strangers to the covenant of promise. What was the promise? Well, the Abrahamic promise of Genesis chapter 12. And that is really the overriding promise. I mean, the great circle that, that surrounds all of God's dealings with Israel is wrapped up in that Abrahamic promise. And inside of that promise, there were many covenants. There was the Mosaic Covenant and the Davidic Covenant. And guess what? The New Covenant. And all of these covenants were inside this great Abrahamic promise in which God promised to bless them and to prosper them and to multiply them and to save them and to redeem them and to give them a kingdom and a great everlasting king, eternal life, the promise of heaven, all of that is wrapped up in that covenant. And by the way, as I said last time, that comes to full fulfillment in the church. But the Gentiles, Paul says here, were strangers to all of that. They had no promises from God. They had no guarantees. They had no nothing. And then fourthly, Paul says next, they were hopeless. Look, look in verse 12 next. Having no Hope. If, 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 if you don't have a true Christ, you don't belong to God's kingdom, you don't have any of God's promises, I'm here to tell you, you have no hope. You don't have any hope. Now, we have a great definition of biblical hope that we hear often from Dr. Steve Lawson in Sunday school. I love this definition. Biblical hope is a confident assurance in a future reality. That's a great definition. Here's another one of biblical hope from John MacArthur. Equally true, equally good. Listen to this one. Biblical hope is confidence based on credible promises from someone who can perform them. 
Listen to that again. Biblical hope is confidence based on credible promises from someone who can perform them. Example, somebody come up to me and say, Brother Philip, I want to give Providence Baptist Church $1 million. I say, man, that's great. We'll buy the whole thing, both buildings and the land. If it comes down to just me and Christy, we'll just have church here. That'd be fantastic. I, we'll, we'll do that. But I got two questions. Number one, here's the first question. Can I believe what you're telling me? Are you credible? Secondly, do you have a million dollars? A credible promise from somebody who can perform is what we're talking about here. Now imagine, here comes God. And he says, I promise you this. First question, is God credible? Yes. Number two, can he deliver? Without a doubt. That's why we put our hope in him, our biblical hope. And that's why biblical hope is confidence based on credible promise from someone who can perform it. Great definition, right? But Paul is saying in verse 12, the Gentiles didn't have that somebody. They didn't have any promises apart from God in Christ. The Gentiles of Paul's day were mostly religious in some kind of way, not secular and atheistic like most of our American culture today. They had all kind of versions of the afterlife, okay? Including not existing anymore, which is still around today. Listen at Diogenes. He said this, I rejoice in sport in my youth. Long enough, I will lie beneath the earth, bereft of life, voiceless as a stone, and shall leave the sunlight which I love, good man though I am, then I shall see nothing more. Rejoice, O soul, in thy youth. Isn't that pitiful? So, Grab all the gusto you can while you're still here, which is not for long because there's nothing coming afterwards. That, my friends, is what you call no hope. That is despair. And then finally, at the end of verse 12, the sum of it all, look what Paul says. And without God in the world. It's bad enough to be a part of this evil world system that God allows Satan on the leash to run for right now. But to be in the midst of this evil world without God? Mm, really terrible. How'd you like to be without Christ right now with what the country is going, going through? And what Paul means here in saying without God, he's not talking about atheists. These people were not atheists. They were, they were idolaters. It means they don't have the true God. That's what he means. They, I mean, they might have been pantheists, believing everything is God. He's in the rocks and the trees like the climate change cookie people. Or, or polytheists, you know. Most of them were polytheists and believing in many gods. But, but in all of that and more, no matter what they were, what version, they would still be without God. So in these verses, Paul is telling these Gentiles, I want you to remember that formerly... Before you came to Christ, you were alienated socially, you were really despised by the Jews, and you were alienated spiritually. You were Christless, stateless, covenantless, hopeless, and godless. And guess what, folks? That's the state of anybody outside of Jesus Christ, even today. And somebody might want to say, well, why did God do that to the Gentiles? Well, he didn't. They did it to themselves. How do I know that? Because I have a Bible. Look at Romans 2 and we'll close with this. Romans 2, 11, Paul says, for there is no partiality with God. Other translations say, no respecter of persons with God. 
He doesn't like the Jews better than the Gentiles, or vice versa. Verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law. Who's Paul talking about right there? The Gentiles, okay? All the Gentiles without the law of God. God God didn't send Moses uh, over to the Babylonians. Look next. Will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law, who's that? The Jews will be judged by the law. What all that means is everybody's accountable. You sin without the law, you're going to be punished. You have the law and you sin with the law, you're going to be punished. But we got to investigate this a little further. Go to verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these Gentiles not having the law are a law to themselves in that, look at this, verse 15, they show the work of the law written where? In their hearts. So God gave Israel his law written into stone, but God also gave every other person ever born into this world, the conscience to see the law of God written where? In the heart. So that everybody is accountable. And if a Gentile is Christless, stateless, covenantless, hopeless, and godless, it's not because God withheld anything from them. God has written his law into every heart. And so he did that. Well, what happened? Well, keep reading your Bible, but go back to Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What did they do? Who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And there's the reason. They suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. They lived unrighteously. Verse 19, look at this. Because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. That's why I always say there's no such thing as an atheist when he lays his head down at night in the still of the night and he's sitting there thinking about things, he knows there's a God. Because God, when God makes it evident to anybody, it's evident. He made it clear. That's their conscience. That's their law in their heart. That's how every human being who has ever lived knows it's wrong if they see me bash another person's skull in with a hammer for no reason at all. Everybody knows that's wrong. Why do they know it's wrong if we're just all a bunch of grown-up germs in the evolutionary scale? It's because God has written His law into every heart. But not only that, God didn't stop there. Also, the outside. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What does the natural man do? He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. And even though it's written in his heart, and even though it's all around him, and even though he can go out there and freak out about the eclipse, just look around, what does he do? He suppresses it. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's idolatry. People have been making ridiculous statues and calling them gods ever since after the fall in the garden. And what's the result? We'll go right to verse 24. Next verse. Therefore God gave them over. Now stop there. Or I'll just preach the whole first chapter of Romans. This is true 
in every age of fallen man. Every bit of this. What I'm telling you is the Gentiles did have opportunity. And what we just read demonstrates what all naturally born sinners, Gentiles, have done and still do with the revelation of God to them, both in the heart and in creation. They suppress that truth. And they don't want to look at it. Then Jesus, he comes on to the scene of human history to grab the hand of the Gentile and to grab the hand of the Jew who all have had faith in him and the blood of his cross and he knit them together into one family, into one church. As we've seen so far, not an easy task. And we still fight the battle today, folks. To see the prayer of Jesus in John 17 answered not just positionally, but practically. Oh, that we would be able to reach out and take the hand of anybody who professes to be in Christ biblically, because there's a lot of cults that name the name of Jesus. I'm talking about people that profess the name of Christ biblically, Draw that hand into ours in unity in Christ as best we can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this teaching of the Apostle Paul and this text. There's so much we can learn from this serious problem that was in the early church right at the beginning between Jew and Gentile, directly connected to disunity that we have in the church today. Help us to learn and to grow from what we have heard today. All to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.